ladies and gentlemen. I speak to you here once again from my uh, 35 square meters of glorious gym empire, ready to answer your intelligent, insightful, and interesting questions, and the other ones, and drink schnapps. Our first question tonight comes from Jesse, who asks about training with a cold. We can make this the general question of training when you're sick. If you have just a head cold, so you're just congested, a bit of a headache, you know, kind of achy neck, that kind of thing, generally feeling sorry for yourself, just come in and train, you'll be fine. It's a good example of you're feeling crap, you come in and you get under the bar and you go through your warm ups and you're fine. It's, it's not the best workout, you don't feel great afterwards. But you get through it and you're fine. If the cold has descended to your chest and you are coughing up horrible green shit, you should probably stay home in the warm. If you do come in, if you've got a burning desire to come in, you've spent too long sitting at home feeling sorry for yourself and watching soppy movies, come in, but drop probably 10, 20% off the bar. This is a case where the movement is more important than the load. You'll get some technique practice out of it. You're not going to do the heavy grindy ones. As for other illnesses, if you have a temperature, or if there are any strange substances coming involuntarily out of either end of you, please stay home. You're not going to get anything out of training. You're probably going to have a rude surprise down at the bottom of a heavy squat. And we don't want to see you. We don't want your diseases. Stay home. Rach asked, why do lower backs have to be so shit? Well, I thought about this one for a bit, Rach. And I thought about the people who say we've only been bipedal for a while, so we haven't adjusted very well to it. But, you know. Crawling around on your hands and knees, you'll soon find your back doesn't feel great. So I don't think that's it. And so far as I know, there isn't any real evidence for that assertion that our bipedalism is, is problematic in some way. Uh, no evidence in physiotherapy or paleontology or anything like that. What I think is the case, what I think is happening is our modern Western lifestyle, sitting a lot. If you look back at old, uh, the old stories, and epic verse, and old medical text from all the way back to Hippocrates, there's all sorts of ailments uh, mentioned. You know, Hippocrates talks about diabetes. And in fact, uh, we get the word diabetes from uh, from uh, the Greek. It's diabetes and plague and all sorts of mysterious diseases pop up and deaths in childbirth and all the rest. But there's very little mention of back pain. Nowadays, back pain is essentially ubiquitous. Basically, everyone's back hurts at some point. And I think these have got something to do with it. And that over there, the computer. And uh, this, all this that we do hunched over all the time. I don't think that helps us. Basically, the abs get weak. The body as a whole gets weak and the abs get weak. If you think about the structure of the spine, the neck part of the spine, it, it's got just a few muscles and stuff around it, uh, but it's not supporting a lot, just the head. It tends to move around a lot too. Then there's the thoracic spine, the part between the neck and the bottom of the rib cage. That's pretty solid. It's attached to the rib cage, so it's pretty solid. Skipping over the lower back and looking down uh, lower, we find the sacrum. That's that sort of triangular part at the base of your lower back. Now, the vertebrae of the sacrum are fused in essentially everyone over 21, uh, 25 years old. 
but even if they weren't, they're attached to the pelvis, so that makes them pretty bomb-proof. The lumbar spine, or lower back, the part between the pelvis and the rib cage, it's got no bony anatomy supporting it. It's just those vertebrae on top of each other with a wall of muscle around in the lower back and the abdominal, and then the guts in there. Now, if we think about the muscular structure of, for example, the abdominals, if the abdominals were designed simply to help you do crunches, they would be structured more like the biceps or the hamstrings, uh, like this long, chunky muscle. In fact, there's a thin layer going down, a layer going across, and a layer going diagonally. Why would there be thin, overlapping layers? Well, you think about the structure of something like a circus tent. By itself, it's not very structurally sound. But it has these cables crisscrossing. When one bunch of cables get slack, the other get tight. Like that. And your lower back muscles and your abdominal muscles work in much the same way. Those crisscrossing cables make what is otherwise quite a wobbly thing into something that pretty bomb proof. If they are strong, you would not get a circus tent and make those cables out of slinky springs. You'd make them out of pretty thick, solid cable. Well, in our case, that thick, solid cable is our muscles. You can think of it too in this way. If you've got a four-legged chair, these two legs at the back are your lower back muscles. These two here are your abdominal muscles, not the abdominal wall muscles. When you're seated, those abdominal muscles are not worked at all. So you get accustomed to that. These get weaker. When you're just on two legs, as your mum probably told you, leaning back on the chair, it's pretty easy. One gets dodgy and you fall over. If you can make it come onto all four legs, that's pretty solid. I've had a 150 kilogram guy sit on that. Get it onto all four legs. Make all four sides of the chair strong. In other words, lift. Some joint mobility is also a benefit. But for most people, the issue is weakness. So it is quite possible for a person to get through decades of their life and spend most of it sitting down. And then even if they're standing up, they're hunched over all the time. So this isn't doing much work. So why are lower backs so shit? Because we let them get weak. And we let the abdominal muscles get weak as well. Uh, Rach also asks, uh, how do you find a not shit physio? So Rach is expressing a bit of excessive cynicism here. But the issue with many physiotherapists is that they're working with the general population. The general population is sedentary. So when they give you exercises with a rubber band, like that, or just little ankle weights to e extend your knee, and so on, well, for the typical person, that is challenging. Physio will often work in rehab, surgical rehab, for example. And most people who require a hip or a knee replacement, it's because they're sedentary and overweight or obese. So when that person then comes to rehab from the operation, relatively little is needed to make a difference to them. 
And if someone goes in and can squat even 60 kilograms, they often don't know what to do. I've trained a guy who, uh, he had a broken wrist and he had an operation to fuse it together. A little hubcap was put in and it reduced the, the wrist mobility. The physio gave him exercises to improve the, the wrist mobility. He couldn't do them. He just did the barbell training and he was able to do those exercises that she'd given him. When he first told her what he had lifted, he deadlifted 200 kilograms or something at 110 kilograms body weight, she did not believe him. She thought he was making it up and he explained, well, that's you know 50% of the world record or something like that. It's not, it's not that big a deal. And she just didn't believe him. And when he went in the second time, she did. Nonetheless, the point is that it was outside his, her experience. She didn't know what sort of exercises to give to somebody who had a, had, had a wrist hubcap fusion and wanted to deadlift 200 kilograms again. Because this is extraordinarily rare. Not many people are like that. So when you go looking for a physio, they're used to dealing with the overweight 65 year old who's had a hip replacement. They're not used to dealing with the person who wants to deadlift 200 kilograms again. It's just outside their experience. So let's not be too harsh on those physiotherapists. They're just going on what the vast bulk of their market is. Now, as to finding one who is better qualified to serve the needs of a lifter, you have to look for one who lifts or who has at least done some sport. Usually these people will give themselves a, some title like sports physiotherapist. They'll have done some sort of further education in uh, physiotherapy to deal with sporting injuries and so on. And they'll be accustomed to the idea of somebody who wants to deadlift 200 kilograms again. They may or may not think it's wise, but they'll be, you know, they won't think it's crazy and surprising. So look for someone who is a sports physiotherapist. Most physiotherapists have web pages and most of them have a little bio of themselves that lays out their experience and their interests. So look for ones who've done some sort of sport, probably not AFL because they don't know anything about training, but some sort of sport like triathlon or, or uh, swimming or discus or track or something like that. If they have that sort of experience, uh, chances are that they will be able to deal with you uh, who's been physically active. Uh, Nandita asks <coughs> about uh, diet for a vegetarian lifting weights. Okay, speaking generally, following the Australian Dietary Guidelines, a person is going to have no trouble getting sufficient nutrition. Following the average diet, which has a lot of KFC and Coca-Cola and stuff, the person is going to have plenty of carbohydrates, fats, and protein, but they're going to have relatively little nutrients, vitamins and minerals, and so on. But just uh, when we look at lifting, we usually think about the protein needs. A vegetarian will find it harder to get protein, and a vegan will find it harder to get protein still. Essentially, Anytime you cut something out of your diet, whether it be for religious reasons, moral or ethical reasons, environmental concerns, allergies, personal taste, whim, whatever, anytime you cut something out, whatever nutrients that thing was giving you, you have to get from some other food in your diet. So if you just have your three cups of veggies a day, your three uh, pieces of fruit, your three cups of grain, mostly whole grain, your three serves of dairy, mostly reduced fat, and your three serves of meat, fish, or beans, you're going to get all the nutrients and so on. If you cut one or more of them out, which I don't recommend you do, but if you do choose to do so for some reason, then you have to know about nutrition because you have to figure out how you are going to get the nutrients that that thing gives you. 
So if you cut out dairy, you're going to have to think, how am I going to get the protein, the calcium, and the vitamin D instead? If you cut out meat, how am I going to get the protein and the iron, calcium, and zinc, and so on instead? If you're a vegan, well, that's symptomatic of mental illness and therefore outside my scope of practice. I don't deal with crazy people. Well, not that kind of crazy anyway. But yeah, so a vegetarian just needs to make it up in dairy, eggs and beans. What they have to watch out for then is that the fat content of dairy and eggs or the carbohydrate content of beans and nuts uh, can lead to a lot of calories being consumed. This is one instance in which protein powders may actually be useful. There exist whey protein powders, of course, which are derived from milk, but there are also vegetable protein powders, pea and rice, or vegetarian protein powders, pea and rice, and so on. Uh, so those are the general considerations, and uh, if your needs are more specific than that, well, this is what a nutritionist or, uh, for medical issues, a dietitian is uh, useful for. Uh, Shibroto asks about lifting with cardiac insufficiency. Okay, so what Shibroto was referring to is if somebody has had a heart attack. Now, for those who don't know, during a heart attack, what happens is that there's a blood clot that gets stuck in one of the blood vessels around the heart and it stops blood flow. The heart then fibrillates, freaks out. It's trying to dislodge that clot, trying to get the, the blockage out of the plumbing. Uh, and if the person survives that, what's happened is that part of the heart was denied oxygen for a time. Part of the heart actually dies. So the person's heart will never be quite the same again. It will not have the same capacity. Cardiac insufficiency. This person probably isn't going to run marathons after their heart attack. As for lifting, well, somebody comes in having had a heart attack at some point in their life. I ask for a referral from their cardiologist, not their GP, the general practitioner, as wise and educated as that person is is not qualified to speak about the effects of lifting on the heart. You need a cardiologist for that. The cardiologist referral will either say, no, this person absolutely should not lift, or they'll say something like, uh, avoid prolonged valsalvas. The valsalva is when you go, when you're lifting something heavy, or trying to squeeze something out. The Valsalva raises your blood pressure quite a lot. That's why the cardiologist is worried about it. Now, your mythical completely healthy person needs to do about 80% of their lifting at 60 to 80% of their max. Whether that 80% is spread over a week or two or 80% over, you know, peaking over four to six week program or whatever is another matter. But basically, 80% of their lifting needs to be at 60 to 80% of their max. And then 20% of their lifting is heavier stuff, 80 plus percent. The person with cardiac insufficiency who has been told to avoid prolonged valsalvas is never going to lift at above 80% of their max. And in fact, some of their lifting will be done at below 60% of their max. As I said earlier, for all people, the movement is more important than the load. This is particularly true when you are dealing with something like being post heart attack. There will be some people who say, don't worry about that shit, just go ahead, lift heavy. But I have this inhibition against killing the people who come into my gym. Some of them annoy me, but I've yet to want to actually kill any of them. People generally, there might be one or two who, if they were to fall under a bus, I would 
probably not shed too many tears except of laughter but everyone who's come to my gym I don't want you to die so I'm going to follow that cardiologist's advice and you're not going to grind out heavy maxes if you've had a heart attack you don't get to max out sorry that's just the way it is you shouldn't have had a heart attack So yeah, they get to stay in the 68, 60 to 80% zone for their entire training lives and occasionally dip below that too. Because we want to make you strong, but we don't want to kill you. Josh asked, what do you have for breakfast? You probably asked that because I said something like uh, the beginning and end of all nutrition questions is what did you have for breakfast? Best answer I ever got was a couple of VBs. Uh, and that's not my answer. My answer is oats. I have oats for breakfast. Uh, I just, I measure them out and while I'm boiling the kettle and then I pour the hot water on them and I leave them for 10 minutes and I have a spoonful of honey and I have a, a cup of milk with them because I want to have my three cups of cooked whole grains each day and that's one of the cups. It makes things work. It makes things flow to have lots of fiber. Oats and so on work well for that. Of course, other people will have things like eggs or grainy toast and that, and, and that's all fine as well. All within the Australian Dietary Guidelines. But that's what I do. Oats gives me a bit of energy to start the day. By mid-morning, I'm ready to have my fruit and yogurt and so on. Uh, except Saturday mornings, I make pancakes for the family. I, I told the kids that it was a Jewish family, uh, Jewish tradition. It's not. I made it up. But um, the kids don't argue. Uh, yeah, Saturday mornings we have pancakes. But the rest, oats. All right. Rant of the week. This week's rant is about all these numpties out there thinking that they've come up with something new and original in the world of training. Let's just look at diet. George Hackenschmidt in The Way to Live, written in 1908, wrote, There are very strong people who are strict vegetarians, whilst others eat a good deal of meat. A fare which consists of three quarters of vegetable food and one quarter of meat would appear to be the most satisfactory. Much has been said lately in praise of sugar as food, but I should not recommend it. Natural sugar, such as, as is contained in dates, figs and other fruit, is certainly preferable. The disadvantages of meat foods are, in my opinion, in the first place, that nowadays it is most difficult to obtain meat from absolutely healthy animals. I count, he said, those artificially fed in stables and pens among the unhealthy ones, and secondly, that far too much flesh food is taken. In the case of pure vegetable food, excess is less dangerous. Is there anything there which has been disproven in the 111 years since? You could be strong eating a lot of meat or strong being a vegetarian. But if you have probably one quarter meat and three quarters vegetable food, you'll probably be all right. Probably don't eat pure sugar, but have fruit instead. And um, if you have animal flesh, if you have meat, it should be meat from animals that have spent their time out in the fields rather than penned up in stables, force-fed. Grouse-fed beef, the Americans like to say. That's all the animals in Australia, but we're a civilised country. And you, you know, having lots of veggies isn't harmful. 1908, boys and girls.